Scions of the Southland, Monday, September 6th, 2021. Mr. Jake Grant, uh, I noticed your shimmering, shining face coming at me a lot closer than usual uh, on Zoom. Do you care to tell the public why? Yeah, uh, my phone is positioned on top of my very expensive silver paperweight um, because I was running some stats for this fine here sports blog while streaming YouTube TV, while I had multiple desktops open, while my computer was six years old, and uh, it gave up. It uh, decided that it no longer wanted to exist, so it uh, crashed, deleted its operating system, and uh, in the process uh, erased its solid state drive. So uh, yeah, just one very heavy paperweight is what my phone is now sitting on top of. And uh, yeah, so if we're all over the place tonight, I am flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah, I'm looking at his face and he's not looking at our shot sheet. So which means I am running the show uh, instead of letting him talk ad infinitum. What a shame. <laughs> oh, no. A uh, true, true tragedy. Uh, this also means that we will be skipping the preview that we were going to do this week because he doesn't have his notes. Uh, so that's fantastic. We will have a guest they for died. next week's. <laughs> Woof. Uh, we will have a guest for next week's. We're not going to spoil what that's going to look like. I think we have them booked, but uh, yeah, well, we could probably firm that one up. Yeah, well, you know, logistics. We'll let the logistics department deal with that one. Should we get started? We have uh, a couple of news items to talk about, I think, but uh, clearly nothing major happened this weekend in Georgia Tech sports land. No, I, uh, I had an enjoyable weekend, and I don't know why anybody wouldn't have. Definitely not, because I, for one, was watching the top 25 ranked volleyball team in action in L.A., Mr. Grant, I noticed you also were tweeting from the Rumble Seat account uh, for this game. Please yeah. tell me what you saw. Our Twitter followers heard it first uh, that I borked my computer, but um, that's no matter. Uh, ESPN Plus is, is beautiful and that you can log into it from many places. Um, Georgia Tech was playing at the Long Beach State uh, tournament that was going on this weekend. Long Beach State. Uh, I called my resident uh, volleyball playing friend. He was out on the West Coast playing men's volleyball in college. And he said that the pyramid is cool, but a not nice venue. So take that as you will. Um, Georgia Tech split the weekend. So a decently nice result. Um, they did beat Long Beach State uh, in four sets. The third one was very, very long. Uh, and by very, very long, it wound up being 33 to 31 at a loss. Uh, so, yes, very fun. Um, probably could have been a three-set dub. But, uh, yeah, uh, at least in that Long Beach State game, I, I think the most important question is, and somebody or maybe two people asked it uh, on Twitter in our uh, replies in our thread, I think we have to start asking, where's Michaela Dowd? Yeah, this is, a, this is a very good point, and I have both of the box scores pulled up. She did not make an appearance versus Long Beach State. Uh, she did get some spot duty in sets two and four uh, versus UCLA later in the weekend, but I think at this point it's got to be fitness-related. I, I can't really think of another explanation, and obviously we don't have access to the press conferences to really – dive deeper and, and ask some questions but it, you know it, at this point I can't really think of any other explanation Bertolino played great but I don't think there's like I don't get how we could see a, a, a fair chunk of her in the exhibition and then almost see none of her in the rotation like there has to be some sort of fitness or injury or maybe just like straight it's busy. It's the beginning of the year, fourth year engineering student, you know, like sometimes there's, Could be. there's, there's those kind of considerations. I know I wasn't necessarily anywhere close to being varsity athlete and it was still hard to be an engineer, you know, like you never know what really is going on, especially as we talk to on rev sports, it's, uh, it's somewhat telling that this is one of the few podcasts you're going to find about Georgia tech non rev sports, but it also belies the fact that like, you know, that it's hard to get some of that info. So <clears throat> Who, who, who really knows? Not I. Um, I don't want to speculate outside of the, hey, it could be injury. It could be busy. It could be life. You know, like we don't, we don't know. 
the point is we don't know but yeah. i don't think like they're i can't really see with how effective she's been the last three years a logical reason for her not to at least be in the rest the rotation or the mix you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I will note, we, we talked last week that Kayla Kaiser was just getting warmed up in that rotation uh, mm-hmm. when they were playing at UCF. She did make some appearances this week. She played all of the Long Beach State game uh, and then was played three sets of the UCLA game with some rotation in there as well. So it's good to see her back. It's good to see her work herself back in the rotation and um, – you know, play uh, and, and get a lot more consistent minutes. Uh, interesting note that I want to put here as well. Uh, it looks like in the UCLA game, uh, Maddie Tippett and uh, Paola Pimentel split time at Libero. Uh, so that's interesting. I don't think we've seen a lot of that historically. We have. Well, I, I didn't think we saw it last week. We did. There's times when they're both playing. Mm, Not to okay. completely sink you on that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Pimentel's I, done a good job of giving Tippett something we like to call rest, which is kind of load easy. management, as they say in the pros. Hey, that could be it with Dowd, too. You never know. Um, but that's the thing, too, is like, I don't think you can undersell the fact that, like, yes, the team got out there a day or two early, but that Long Beach State game. Body started. clock. Body clock game. Well, it ended at like 1 a.m. Eastern, too. Like, and, and, and granted, it's not like Penn State UCF where you had two games in one day, but whoop, that's hard. Yeah, uh, I I did also miss that uh, uh, Tippett and Pimentel rotated in and out during the Long Beach State game. So that is shame on me. Uh, I, I do want to go back to what you said about Berlino. She did very, very well this weekend, um, mm-hmm. especially versus Long Beach State. And I think she got a lot of praise from the, the local announcing crew as well. Uh, the, stat that, the stat that I have in front of us, and I think this extends to Brillin Morissette as well, who had a banner uh, banner game versus Long Beach State as well. I'm seeing a uh, 54 or, or 541 attack percentage for Bertolino and then a 615 for uh, Morissette. That's uh, that's some winning volleyball right there. Yeah, I'm I'm sure those numbers are right but i have no way to prove them so i like hearing them though <laughs> i will say Some of that you gotta you gotta like yes that's efficient but like uh, hopefully that's i i mean for for Bertolino, you know, i know that's on a decent number of uh of you know just volume of touches and, and opportunities just from having watched the game and noted that then uh presumably i did see a lot of more set just uh casually again i know we usually like to talk numbers on this podcast but given that it's numbers for this podcast that imploded my computer uh were giving me a break on this one but you know like <laughs> the, the if, if you're hitting above i don't know a, a team's usually in the mid 200s mid 300s ish range if you're if you're doubling that up you're you're in good territory mm-hmm. I, I do want to know in the long beach state game uh, three of these sets were not close um the set one was 25 15 set two was 25 16 uh, and set four was 25-15 again. It, like, it was a very, very good performance in those three sets. The third one was weird, uh, but you're always going to have one of those here and there. So uh, I'm not... And, and, too- and that's the thing, too. It's not, like, it's not like Long Beach State's some, like, you know, meh team. Like, the, the big, big West in terms of volleyball is pretty solid. Long Beach, d- decent team. You're, you're going to lose a set here or there. Like, it, mm-hmm. if, if you're going to... If you're going to drop one, don't drop three, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will also add the announcer did a good job of explaining Long Beach's, Long Beach State's current existence, so to speak. Uh, they are sort of, you know, they're, they're going through a transition period where they're rotating in a lot of, uh, a lot of younger talent um, and are having, you know, are going through those growing pains. Uh, and, and so that team might, once it gets its sea legs here, might look a lot different towards the end of the year. But obviously this is game four and game five uh, in a very, very long season. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, in terms of the UCLA game, you kind of did the reverse of what you said there, which is don't drop three. Uh, they did end up dropping three on this one. And I mean, they played it close for two of these 
four sets. I mean, the middle two sets were 22-25. Uh, what that one went to UCLA, and then 27-25. That one went to Georgia Tech. But I mean, on the outsides here, it was 25 to 11 and 25 to 11. So this one, I think, that's was a bit more, great. bit more of a mixed bag. You see, just off the box score that I'm seeing here, Bergman and and from uh, from Bila had a lot lower production. I mean, you know that uh, from Bila and Bergman are going to post upwards of uh, upwards of eighteen, upwards of twenty points a game. And I mean, from Bila had eighteen and a half, and Bergman had fourteen. Uh, in, in the UCLA uh, match. So they were doing a good job of, of getting up there, getting those blocks. I mean, as a team, UCLA had 14 blocks total. So um, it, it was a very, very good defensive performance, I would say, from, from UCLA. And I mean, they're also ranked in the top 25. So it, it's nothing to really sneeze at. That's uh, especially when you're playing teams that are at the same talent level, at the same performance level. Um, you're going it, to, it's always a toss up, right? Yeah. You're, you're going to drop some of those. Um, and, and again, like, not that this is the one size fits all catch all type thing is like, you know, I, I still wouldn't say based on like gut feel exhibition, what we've seen in the first weekend that we're necessarily necessarily playing our buckle up and, and it's time to ride roster um so you know the, the fact that there are newer faces getting that playing time like that's you know you you want to see the win and i, and I don't want to like just be like ah yeah they lost oh well but like also ucla is a good team and they've been a good team longer than we've been a good team <laughs> yep if that is a fair thing to say like, like they they know how to play they have good defense and Fair enough. Um, moving along to what their schedule looks like this weekend here, uh, they'll host – George Tech will host its own uh, early season tournament at home uh, at O'Keefe. They will play uh, Mississippi State, uh, Indiana, and Oklahoma. All of those games will be on ACC Network Extra. This, I think, is where you sort of need to defend home turf. I think that's a little cliché. But establishing, you know, setting the tempo at home um, and, and really proving that O'Keefe, now that it's able to be full to the brim again, for, uh, is, you know, an you know, intimidating, a dominant place to play. And they make that environment pay off, right? Yeah. Yeah. Those are all classically good program. Well, Mississippi State isn't traditionally a power, but, you know, you, you get a good solid big 12 team a good solid big 10 team all those are power opponents like it, it, in terms of providing value to the season ticket holder this year like it's like saying hey instead of getting 18 home games they're going to get 13 but we're trading out six rando non-con games for these three power five games i i think that's a good trade-off it's, it's good to get them in the building it's a good it's a good roster. We, we talk, or not a good schedule, roster, roster yeah. teams, schedule. Um, and even if Mississippi State is not, uh, you know, not a hot shot in the SEC, and I haven't looked at the record, so I, maybe I shouldn't comment specifically. But even if they're not a traditional hot shot in the SEC, I think we're still talking about a team that has a higher average talent level than some of those teams that we've yep. historically played in the first three or four weeks. So uh, it's I'll much take... better to see them than Alabama state. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'll take it just to review the actual schedule and dates and times and everything uh, all times Eastern, of course, uh, on the ninth, that is Thursday, Thursday uh, at 7 PM mm -hmm. versus Mississippi state. Uh, the 10th on Friday, uh, the, that's a 7 PM again uh, versus Indiana. And then on the 12th, that is Sunday, uh, that's a 1 p.m. tip versus Oklahoma. All games again at O'Keefe Gym. Mr. Grant, would you like to move on to the second, more depressing part of our talk today? No. <laughs> Too bad we get paid to do this. Technically not. This is a labor of love. Anyway, game one, football, NIU. 
where do we want to start? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I assume you don't either. So let's, no, let's keep it I mean, short. We did sit next to each other for this game. So we, we knew exactly how uh, we knew what we were going to be walking into uh, with, with where we were at feeling here. Um, I don't care what the, my, my main takeaway, I don't care what the call should have or could have been on the two point conversion. The game never should have been in that place in the first place. Yep. That's my main takeaway. Everything else looked at best lethargic or slippery or just ineffective and at worst, like concerning. And it's going to be a long year if, if it's not a fluke, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I did have some discussions in Discord uh, with other fans with Collins, this has been a historic problem uh, at other head coaching stops that he's had specifically, I guess Temple's the only one, uh, but I mean, they lost to Villanova in the first week of the season and then ended up making a bowl like that. That is on the table. However, Temple is not playing a schedule with four pendant auto losses. So that's number one um, that that makes things difficult. In terms of, I guess, metadata or looking at this game from, you know, a higher level than what was just on the field. Uh, attendance was, I think, reported at 33,000 uh, out of a possible 55,000. Um, obviously, you Gosh. have. It would be wonderful if we could check those attendance figures for their historical rebel relevancy. But, you know, we hey, get it. We get it. Your computer is broken. <laughs> I so I'll I'll say this much: thirty three thousand. You have to account for COVID. That's definitely a concern for a lot of people, especially with with children, um, and that's a, a like a valid and honest concern. Um, I did notice less kids, just from my like tangential like the stadium vibes kind of view. Yeah, you know, it was definitely more of a adult affair, um, and that's for better or for worse, right? It, it's. It, it sucks not to have all of your fans in the arena, especially the younger ones, just for the experience uh, value there. Um, both of us were sitting on the, what was it? The West stands uh, in the West corner of the stands uh, from our Second vantage point. point. Uh, you don't have to give them our social security number while you're at it too. Not um, your section, bro. It's mine. Anyway, <laughs> moving on from, uh, from that, uh, I think, both of us saw that the upper east stand was basically empty uh, and the upper north stand was also basically empty. Obviously, we can't see behind us mm -hmm. for the upper west stand. Uh, it was a 7.30 p.m. kickoff. So um, things, I mean, things were cool. It wasn't really a weather concern. It was pretty clear outside. Uh, mm -hmm. The sun, had, uh, it, it's a night game. Sun had basically gone away. I will note uh, the student section was almost, 100 percent full at, or 90, at least 90 to 95 percent full uh by the time uh, things kicked off on the on the north end zone so i think that's that's really cool um that's not something that you saw at kick a lot when i was on campus so uh that i think is something to something to at least build upon and see if that we can we can continue that um I don't have advanced stats for this game. Robert does. Uh, he will go over those later this week uh, in his recap. But the one notable poll I want to make on the stats side is uh, Tech as a unit, as a defense, only had three Havoc plays on the night. It's, it's not acceptable. It's far under national averages. It's, it's patently unacceptable. I thought that was supposed to be our thing. You know, Minister of Mayhem, he said. Havoc, grit, with a straight face. Yeah, I think I'm going to try to counterbalance Jake's uh, general an antipathy today uh, in an unusual role reversal. But it's, to put it politely, to put this as politely as possible, uh, and I know I've done my fair share of doom posting uh, in various avenues this weekend. He's on the Just hot seat. He's on the hot seat. It's 
this performance is unacceptable. Uh, I, I think there's full credit to be given to NIU for taking advantage, for coming in here, uh, putting together a really cohesive game plan, uh, taking their taking their chances when they could, and especially going for that two point conversion to to seal the game. Right, I think that's a mm-hmm. really really smart decision on the road. Um, and they got a, you know, they got the win and a $1 million pay payday out of it. Right. Um, you can't, but, but the, the caveat remains that you can't lose to a team that was winless in 2020 and is histor- like the last couple of years has looked a little aimless. Right. And mm-hmm. again, I'm not trying to belittle the point belittle NIU as a program, but and we talked about the caveats that come with their winless season last year, but it's, it's unacceptable period. I mean, I'm just annoyed that so many people acted like it was an auto win when I loudly pointed out some of these caveats and I'm not saying I've been an NIU fan for a long time, but just proximity. I I don't know. It's, it's one of those, you know how they say when you pass the ball, Three things happen and two of them are bad. Yep. When you pay a, a a lower tier team to come to your stadium, the result is either you win and everyone expects you to, or you lose and it's worse. And we can you talk know? about that that same possibility for next week a little later on, but it's it's not acceptable. I I think it. And I think that GT fans on the internet have been, and, and myself included, I'm not going to fault. I'm not going to separate myself out of that. I think have been a little doomerist, a little uh, defeatist, actually not just a little, like very, very um, d- disappointed is not the right strength of the word. It's like very almost depressed. And I don't blame them. I think this, even if you say that, oh, this is a one game sample, when I say it's unacceptable to lose this game, it's a, the way that they lost it is unacceptable, right? I think you can argue that they cleaned up a couple of things, right? You can, they cleaned up penalties. They only had one penalty on the night, if I remember correctly, um, Mm -hmm. which which is great. That's a, that's a a market improvement from last season. Um, They, but they struggled to get, they struggled to line up on defense when NIU wanted to go tempo. They uh, they struggled to get the right run fits uh, when NIU was running the ball and NIU was able to run the ball really effectively. Um, the, the offensive play calling was good, but the execution wasn't there. Um, I think we can talk a lot about uh, scheme and and that kind of stuff here and there, but at the same time, you're just – talking about a defense that got that was faced with a run heavy offense and got dinked and dunked all the way over the field uh, at times and was just not prepared. It, it just didn't look fully prepared and it is very disappointing. Uh, there's no, there's no better way to say it, right. It was just very disappointing. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh <laughs> run heavy offense uh getting dinked and dunked all over the field also does not bode well um that being said i try not to come off as the anti everything the world is ending fan however however i think that there is some amount of reckoning that needs to happen uh moving forward especially pending the results of next week um whether that is head coaching hireability because ultimately that also the responsibility also falls with like staff like his staff and like the people that hired him and and you know like it's there's no one person you can blame for for any failure of especially especially a team as large, uh, bureaucratic, um, uh, I guess, hugely rostered as football, right? It's not, it's not basketball where you can say, wow, Josh Okogie, we didn't expect him to go to the NBA after two years. 
gosh, that really threw a wrench in the plans. Like that, like it's not basketball, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's not, I'd say it's not volleyball either. You know, it's, it, and it also has the largest spotlight on it. So you can be super, super successful at volleyball, at women's cross country, at swimming and diving, at baseball, at heck, even at men's basketball. But at the end of the day, it's unfair, but the success of the program gets judged based off of one sport alone, which is a complete crock and kind of against what we say as a podcast here, but it doesn't help our perception with sidewalk fans and with the rest of the country and with media and recruits and other coaches. Like it, it, it stinks that it all comes down to, you know, a two point conversion. And, and even walking out of that game, if we win 21, 20, the results like, I think we're still having the same conversation. Yes. Honestly, I think we're still, it's like a win. It's what you said before. A win is fine. A win in that scenario is cool because you were expected to do it, but a loss can only lead to, you're having the same narrative, right? The narrative, the underlying numbers, the the underlying narratives are the exact same. It's just a difference in two points. (laughs) Well, and, and the funny thing too is like, Look at Miami versus Bama. Miami goes in and loses by roughly the spread to Bama and gets knocked down in the polls 12 points or 12 places because of it, right? Like they did exactly what everyone expected them to do, right? Uh Even if we won, which is what everyone expected us to do, we were still nowhere close to the spread, to the SP plus line, to the Binion index, to whatever uh, Vegas or otherwise advanced stat you want to look at just winning in this case i don't think was enough and i hate saying that but i think it's true for me to be confident in this season i think for us to be confident this season let me not speak just for myself because i think we're on the same page it had to be you win and cover the spread yeah uh and that's not even just for confidence that's that now that i think about it that's just for continuing the same opinion the same opinion that we had competence maybe yeah yeah. Um, right now, I think there are some serious questions that have to be answered about play calling defensively, specifically. Um, I, I think some of the where attention is gone um, program wise, uh, where focus is put. And it, this, I don't think this is the time to blame specific players or uh, or anything. Uh, it was unfortunate that Jeff Sims uh, got injured. And he was having he was having a rough case of the nerves, especially early on. I, I don't I think he just looked uncomfortable. Um, it, it's none of it is really his fault it, that that happens. The yips happen. Um, we also haven't gotten an update on his injury yet. So keep that in mind. Um, well, and, and that's the thing, too. It's game one. How much can you blame any of the players that are going off? there, literally riding off of what they were just taught all offseason. Yeah. And the other I, thing is. The other thing is, this is a little bit hotter, and now you've got me a bit riled up. You can probably tell. Well, we'll keep it it PG. I don't want to have to edit. Who's the one that gave – or or who's the one that was the lockdown kicker for more than half a year, and then all of a sudden he can't hit the broad side of a barn? I think the kickers are also put in a tough spot, honestly. Uh, That was another thing that I actually don't have on the shot sheet. Um, if you watch some of those, I'm going to call them set pieces, but that is a soccer term. Uh, if you watch some of those, if you watch the extra points, if you watch the field goal attempts, uh, the blocking up front was pretty poor. You saw a, a special teams line get pretty manhandled by NIU and whether that was NIU jumping, getting good jumps on some of those attempts, uh, or getting good penetration, I get either way, full credit to them, but uh, on paper, that is a more talented special teams unit than NIU has. Um, and you're supposed to be able to win that battle at, at the line. It's unfortunate that Samaglia tripped uh, or slipped on the turf on his second field goal attempt. That happens. Uh, like that, It's unfortunate. Um, on the first one, that one is, it again, it, it happens, but it's a little bit more uh scrutinized just because he was able to get it off he was completely you know right form and everything just missed it um and then the the other one is you're you're 
a desperation kick from midfield. I don't know what you want. Like, I don't know what Gavin Stewart can do about that. Um, but in I wasn't any case, referring to this year's kickers, by the way, when I said that. <laughs> I know. I just wanted to add some more color. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I, I think it is it, it is worth noting that. I think we could dive deeper into running versus passing effects efficacy of passing versus running play calling uh, what we were doing when but I, I don't think that does any of us any much more good than we've uh, been able to even glean out of what we've already talked about yeah uh, let's move on let's switch gears to week two because a football is a cruel and unforgiving sport Kennesaw State will show up at Georgia Tech next week uh, for a noon kickoff. I think that's on an RSN. I haven't actually checked. Uh, that is bad podcasting on my part, considering the other one of us has a broken computer. What do we think here about Kennesaw State, given the events of Saturday? Is it possible to say an FCS team can smell blood in the water? I think it's totally possible. I think it's feasible. Because this is, and, and we've had this game circled for a long time. Circled as for being, like out of fear, to be fair. As this, this has the, uh, this has the poor, like coincidence level amounts of, wow, this game, this team, this offense at this time of being the, the for lack of a better way to put this, the one game referendum on the Jeff Collins experiment. Yep. Because you are facing a team that is running a, uh, uh, a slightly modernized, but still, still at his core, the triple option offense that we ran for 11 seasons here Mm -hmm. under a predecessor that was in, in my humble opinion, a bit unfairly lambasted for said offense. Um, uh, uh, on a team that is uh, not necessarily putting its best foot forward out already. So, like, again, like, you can't even call it last week a letdown look ahead to this. Like, uh, and, and granted, one one game does not a season make. At the end of the day, it, it just doesn't. But it's getting late early on 2021 if we're looking Clemson down the barrel also having – locked two losses in already the two losses that you had penciled in as wins or almost even penned in as wins to begin the season yep uh it, it, it's bitterly disappointing i don't think would cut it at that point i think i'd have to start using larger and more expletive filled phrases um yeah but i don't know i i kind of don't know what to expect um i just hope they're prepared I have a lot of stuff about Kennesaw's history and what Kennesaw is doing now um, and that sort of thing. They're five years old. I mean, a lot of stuff in terms of I have a lot of words in front of me. I didn't say that there were a lot of (laughs) I didn't say that I had all their years and decades of history written down. But my, my point is that, like, I think beyond giving you a preview, it's more of a the the thing, the overwhelming feeling that I have is this is a I think you said it best right it's a program or era defining game for better for worse it's not for better or for worse it's for worse because he has to win there's no he has to win I'm not even going to explain it this is a game you have to win well and and Akshay here's the thing too this game Granted, Jeff's had a little bit more time than a coach who we shouldn't mention, but who is notorious for not being an awesome coach at Georgia Tech. This is the game that separates the Bobby Ross trajectory from the Bill, you know, Lewis trajectory. Mm -hmm. It's. This is I. There is no good way to put this or no cohesive way to put this or or whatever you want to say. It's. This is a game you need to win. It's that simple. 
I don't really have anything more in terms of previews. You know what offense they run. You know that they're a new FCS team. You know that they play in the Big Sun or the Big South. I got it's got to be the Big South. That's a typo. On the it was the or are they oh. in the A's the rest of their stuff? Oh, did he mix? Did he mix multiple? This is coming from one of our writers. So I'm not gonna. I now can't say his name for lack of a for or because I would uh, make fun of him on the internet. But I now spend I have, too much time reading extra points and not enough time reading like football score boxes. In that, I don't know if the Atlantic Sun are rumors. Or their current actual conference. So, so the A Sun didn't start playing football until this year. My understanding, at least from the internet, is that all of uh, they play football in the Big South, uh, and ah. they play all the other sports in the A Sun. I think our writer that did this just mixed both of the uh, both of the conferences together, which is a very funny portmanteau, to be fair. Um, yeah. So I'm going to give him credit for it. They are a good team. Win For what the game. they are, they're a good team. Win the game. They're Alabama. Yeah, they're a good FCS team. Win the game. That's all I got. You got anything else? Yeah. Um, for those who don't already and haven't already seen this, uh, check out Game on Paper for Akshay's site. It's been going around the internet. Um, following along, advanced plays. I did want to get that in before um, – before we moved on too far, I think that frames some of these NIU, uh, Kennesaw, uh, other games we saw as well, even Georgia Clemson. Very helpful to have uh, some more advanced stats kind of at the the touch of your finger uh, rather than having to wait for, you know, us to figure that out. So the irony is that NIU Georgia Tech doesn't have play by play data. And so yeah. there are no advanced stats, which is why I couldn't bring them to you. Fair enough. Well, also, but, he knew that I wasn't going to mention it, and so he shoehorned it anyway. Yep. I didn't want to forget, and I don't have a computer in front of me to take notes, so it was on my brain. That's Again that's my with the computer. Football. My God. It's, it's going to be a bit. And once he gets yep. his actual computer, he's still going to say it's broken, and it's going to be a very good bit. Ugh. One day, one day we'll have attendance data again. One day we'll have ACC titles data again. But today's not that day. Um, let's see what 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 else do we have to get out uh, before uh, we, we leave. I don't think I don't think we have anything else. This is going to be a short one. I do want to note a couple of softball updates. They are starting their their preseason soon. Uh, they did pick up two commits today, who I, whose names I am pulling up right now. Uh, Paige Vuka Vuka Dinovich. I hope I'm pronouncing that right out of Iowa. Uh, obviously softball is uh, hard to get recruit rankings for, but I am looking at her Twitter feed. Uh, Iowa premier U18 national Georgia tech commit class of 22. Uh, and then uh, Grayson Tucker, uh, who's a Georgia gal, a two-time USA softball, all American, a Georgia six, a first team, all state selection, a top 50 player, according to extra inning softball, uh, for the class of 2023. So yeah. very, I mean, at least on paper, uh, obviously we, again, we don't have recruiting rankings, but at least based on what we can see very, two very, very good recruits. Yeah. Uh, big fan of the former, um, our, uh, roving ACC softball correspondent has, uh, played on teams with her in the past so got got good marks um fun to play with good good locker room presence so should be a good ad there um the latter i I don't know as much about not so much uh the uh the uh grant historical uh neck of the woods so we'll work on it um but um in, in terms of gets you know it's it's good to have them in the building and and we'll get to see them on campus i believe in time for next year wow it starts over every year. The cycle gets anew, right? There's, there's never a rest. So, yeah. Also those recruits won't be on campus until the fall of 22. And one of them won't even be on campus until the fall of 23. So it's, it, it's a long cycle here. Jeez. Did they really back it out that far again? I thought they cut it down to 
Oh, maybe the second one was a verbal. Okay, never mind. I yeah, need both to brush of them. Off. Both of them are verbals. I don't think they've signed anything. Okay, I was gonna say because because for we can dive into this someday, but like there was a hot minute. We were still in high school then, but where like eighth and seventh graders were verbally committing to schools. Like, That's legal though. You, there are no uh, there are no restrictions on commitments. On they tried to commit- shut that. They tried to shut that down, though, at least. I'm making air quotes for those that can't see. Podcasting is a visual medium. Yeah. Hey, hey, for as, for, as much, uh, for as much as we take inspiration from certain podcasts, uh, among them Split Zone Duo, it was, it was nice to hear them shouting out your, your site. So, you know, stop giving maybe me both ways. Stop giving yeah. me fame. Stop. This makes Akshay uncomfy, but I'll gas him up all week, so. I don't like compliments. They, they're uncomfortable. They're very uncomfortable. Anything I'm else I'm to change gears, to change gears before we, before I have to listen to you compliment me again, anything else before we leave? Um, what are you doing your Olympic book report? I've been waiting on the edge of my seat. For well, like I have it crossed out now, so we're, we're going to get to it eventually. <laughs> I, uh, it, it's been a rough sports weekend. We can talk about more rough sports things. Uh, well, I guess the Olympics were a good sports thing uh, and the book was good, but yeah, well, uh, we'll, we can discuss that at another time when we have more time in our afternoons. Yeah, for sure. Cool. We will see you all next week. Fingers crossed.